of the agenda pass those items so those of you who have come to speak or to be here with us uh, uh, can do so. So I welcome you tonight and I'm going to call roll and that won't take long, will it? Um, Ms. Parker, uh, Ms. Martin, Mr. Pennings, Mr. Moore, Present. Mr. Atkinson, Mr. Bates, Mr. Beaver, Here. Ms. Powers, Ms. Morency, and Mr. Dudley. Let's stand the McDowell uh, Elementary School is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, after which we will have a moment of silence. Oh, is it Mount Pleasant? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Thank you. Well, I hope I've got the right agenda because it said McDowell. So I'm at Mount Pleasant. There's no. Is this artwork from McDowell or Mount Pleasant? I'm sorry. That'll be fun if I printed off the wrong agenda, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, now, Murray County. Uh, Public school administrators, do you have anything to, Dr. Marshall? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yes, we have a couple new administrators that have started since the last board meeting. I'd like to uh, invite up first Ms. Karen Gagliano. She's our new uh, chief financial officer, and um, just want to give her a general welcome and give her a chance to introduce herself. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is day number six for me, so I'm baptism by fire, and uh, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to be here and happy for the opportunity. Um, lots of great things happening in your school system and a lot of very passionate people, so uh, it's great to join the team. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and I think I saw Mr. Marshall come in. Is he still in the room? Think, hey, there he is. Come on up, sir. This is Mr. Marcus Marshall. He is the new principal at Mount Pleasant Middle School. So, Mr. Marshall, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I didn't come prepared to speak, but I do want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Marzak and the board and for all of those uh, who have supported me thus far. Uh, the sky's the limit at Mount Pleasant, and so that's exactly where we plan to, to strive to go. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Welcome. <laughs> and that's it, Ms. Right, Madam Vice thank Chairman. You. You're well, welcome. Will someone check to see if there are any public delegations that have signed up to speak? Four, okay. Melinda Holt. Okay. Okay, Ms. Holt, uh, we limited to five minutes. If you'll give us your address, you live in Murray County? Yes, ma'am. All right, and um, so glad to have you. Thank you. Um, my name is Melinda Holt, and I'm a Spring Hill native, and um, this is my first year with children in the Murray County Public School System. Um, we have homeschooled up until this year, and so this year I have a fourth grader, a second grader, and a kindergartner, and um, a four-year-old who will be starting kindergarten next year. Um, and so in the midst of us getting accustomed with the uh, public school system, um, I have been a bit shocked with the um, celebration of Halloween inside of my children's classrooms. Um, as I have looked through, I know that there isn't any ruling on uh, the celebration of Halloween. Um, I love the fall, and I love pumpkins, and I love the harvest season. Um, but there have been several, uh, three different occasions um, with my 
with the elementary school that we go to in particular, um, where there have been haunted hallways. And um, as much as I teach my children about the good that is in the world, I also teach them about the reality of evil. And so it's been a constant um, point of conflict for them. Is my hallway in my school really haunted? Are these things really um, happening? Um, and so I um, have just gone through, and, and even in the curriculum of the uh, handbook for Murray County students, um, even when it comes down to their wellness, so much of it has to do with um, their mental and emotional behavioral health and uh, the, the attitudes inside of the classrooms. Um, one of the, the things that I found very interesting um, was the CSH, the Coordinated School Health, and how it just, every, there's eight points there, and six of the eight particularly speak to the emotional health and dimension of um, the, the effect that that has on a child while they're in the classroom. And so when my kids come home and their teachers have um, begun to read things like um, uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, for example, in my fourth graders class, because there's no, no curriculum rule set against the fear mongering in the season, there's no um, thing against that. And so my school has worked with me. They are looking to work with me and have, but they're looking for leadership from you guys. And um, so with that, I'm really excited about the um, strategic plan that you guys have and in the very, the new one that you guys have been out um, all month promoting. And so in the very beginning of that, um, one of the things that, that your intro says is, in an era of great global change, we face the challenge of preparing today's students for an unknown and uncertain future. And um, also, with us being the southernmost county within the Nashville metropolitan um, area, and us being such a quick growing county, which I've just purchased our second home, um, which we're really excited to call Columbia home and um, to live and grow our family. Um, but I, I just feel like we are behind on this, as I know um, that some of the surrounding counties do have regulations in place on their celebration of Halloween. So I'm just looking for you guys uh, to put into motion some regulation that my school can take a further lead uh, to prevent um, any disruption and any emotional um, havoc for my kids and understanding of good and evil and just like up here this very colorful art that you guys have from these sweet kiddos at Mount Pleasant Elementary School there's 31 um, pictures up here and um, three of them are not um, in a scary or horrific nature when you look at them and so um, my kids are a part of all all means all and I just don't think that my kiddos should have to be ostracized because we didn't celebrate the um, popular tradition of Halloween. So, thank you very much. Uh, Columbia Central Collegiate Academy. And I see your address is 921 Line Parkway. We just moved in this year. Yeah. <laughs> Would you, would you give us your name, though? Uh, my name, oh, um, good evening, school board members. <laughs> my name is Dan LaFond. I've been teaching at Columbia Central High School for the last six years. In addition to coaching the women's rugby program, I teach 10th grade English, sociology, psychology, and the Columbia Central Collegiate Academy's public speaking course. I'm joined this evening by two Collegiate Academy students, Chelsea Burns and Drew Williamson, seniors at Columbia Central High School, and they'd like to speak to you tonight about an upcoming event at Columbia Central. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chelsea. And I'm Drew. <laughs> Drew and I were in the same kindergarten class and grew up together in Murray County Public Schools. On Tuesday, December 5th, along with 12 of our classmates, we will be hosting an event at Columbia Central. While reflecting on our 12 years in public education, we have set out to propose new ideas and creative solutions to the problems facing our school system. 
These are not small ideas, nor are they impossibly ambitious or fanciful. They are big ideas, the kind of ideas that people are afraid of, the kind of ideas that shatter the status quo. They will take an open mind to hear, perseverance to plan, and courage to enact. Our goal is to present real, actionable plans that will empower students and educators and propel Murray County educational experience to the level of prestige we know it capable. More details about the event will be forthcoming. It is our hope that you join us on the evening of Tuesday, December 5th for a night of big ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question, Mr. LaFon, what time on the 5th? Uh, more details forthcoming. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Sean Pons. Good evening, board members. And if you'll give us your address as well. My address is 1403 Perkins Lane, Columbia, Tennessee. Okay. I am a high school parent. My question is posed to the board, is there any way possible we can get put in the budget that we have ambulances at all public high school football games? It's not just for the football players. There are things that happen in the stands that need attention as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pons. Uh, Justin Drake, and you're actually on the agenda as well, so. Members of the board, good evening. Uh, my name is Sergeant Justin Drake, United States Army, 4979 Miller Lake Road. It's in Cullioca. Uh Uncle Sam recently imported my family down here. Uh, we will work at the Columbia Mall, what's left of it, at the local Army Recruiting Center. Um, I got two children that attend Mount Pleasant schools, one in the middle school, one in the elementary. And uh, my concern this evening is simply the bus system. Uh, I understand there was uh, recent rezoning throughout the county. Uh, my boy, he's a middle schooler, and he is within the Mount Pleasant zone. My daughter is uh, zoned for Brown Elementary. So we got an out of area exception for her to attend Mount Pleasant schools uh, for the sake of simplicity. Now my concern is with the bus schedule. Uh, he is allowed to take the bus. It stops at our driveway, picks him up, and takes them all the way to school. It's my understanding that that same bus en route to Mount Pleasant Elementary and Middle School picks up several elementary school kids as well. Uh, but my daughter is not allowed to ride that bus, the same bus that stops in our driveway and stops at her school every morning and every afternoon. And I understand that uh, we are one of several families in the area affected by this. So you know, just for the sake of common sense, uh, I spoke to Mr. Perriman and Perryman, rather, and uh, he told me that we are one of several families from that immediate vicinity to have called about that. So he advised me to present this evening to you fine folks. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. Not sure what further steps we ought to take, but. Uh, Mr. Drake, I think uh, Chairman Parker had said she had spoken uh, to you as well and said that we would discuss it at our, our work session in November. Oh, Okay. understood. Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank, Thank you, you much. Sir. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kinzer, Dr. Marzak, board members, appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, the uh, work session a few weeks ago that uh, we were invited by Chair Parker to come forward and share some ideas uh, concerning several issues. And we responded to her invitation. Uh, she wanted them by October 31st so that you uh, board members would have it uh, in your hands. Uh, uh, a look at some ideas, uh, maybe some policy revisions at uh, cell phones. And so with that in mind, I've asked one of our Murray County educators to come forward and share some, uh, some of those ideas with you and, um, and some other things as well that go along with that. So appreciate your good attention on this. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Hubner. Hi, I'm Joy Golden. I'm a Murray County public school teacher. And I, when, when Mr. Hubner asked me this, I did a random sampling of different teachers from different locations around the county. And I wanted to start off with just a couple of examples of what we go through every day. This was one teacher, everyone please put away your cell phones. 
Then next, you have something to write with. We're going to be working on, and in the midst of that sentence, uh, one student interrupts her, no acknowledgement, headphones are in, student moves in front of the, the teacher moves in front of the student again and says, please put up your cell phone. The student responds, oh my freaking God. Student snatches headphones out and argues with the teacher. Teacher walks to the desk to pick up work and when returns back, the student has the phone back out. Request third time. Then she says the student's name, I'm asking you one more time to please put away your phone so we can begin and I'm writing a paint slip this time. The student says, shut up. The teacher said, did you ask me to sh or tell me to shut up? The student says, no, I told myself to shut up. The student finally put up the cell phone. At another school, uh, is a middle school setting, the students may have their phones out for recreational purposes. The teachers spend large amounts of time asking students to put their phones away during instruction, instructional times. Students also feel that it is appropriate to finish all their texts or talking or taking a snapshot before they end it putting away. Transcripts of teacher-student conversations are often texted between students and to parents during the school day. Um, should be reiterated that these are middle school students all under the age of 14. At another school said, this teacher wrote, uh, a few kids pull them out and do try to Snapchat under their desks or wherever, but it's very obvious and we always catch them. We have a problem with them using them in the hallway and, and they don't put them away, but they make a lot of excuses while we're trying to teach. And they do refuse to cooperate. They can't hear instructions. There are arguments. But we, do but we have the opportunity to take up phones so it doesn't happen too much here. In most of the other schools and where I teach, we, did, we believe that we didn't have the opportunity to take up phones this year. Um, I sent uh, some things that as I was looking through the cell phone policy, I wrote up some things that I felt like could be clear, better stated, I guess, or clearer. I'm a professional writer also. And so the very first part of this, I just did, I made some edits to it. After that, I made these additions to the policy. And again, these can be massaged any way to help just carry out our job to make it as e easier on us. Uh, use of cell phones for any voice or text communication is strictly prohibited during instruction time. The latest thing that we're noticing students are doing, they have their cell phone, I mean their earbuds in, and they're actually talking to somebody, which it could be another in another class, they could be cheating, they'd be talking to their parents or whatever. Uh, when a student does adhere to the cell phone policy and cell phone use disrupts instructional time, a teacher or other school personnel has the right to ask the student to place his or her cell phone in an envelope in a designated area until the end of that instructional period. At the end of the period, the student may ask for the cell phone to be returned. That's something that we're asking for. At another meeting I was at about a month ago, we were may being compared um, or maybe looking at Williamson County and some of their co some of the things that they do. And I know from personal experience that one of the things self that their cell phone policy, if a student is, has it out um, for an extended period of time and it's not instructional use, they have a piece of paper, they wrap, they wrap around that phone, they take the phone up, and the student has to go to detention. They're serious about their instructional time. A uh, cell phone that is fully charged before entering the school building may be used for instructional purposes. What we're also finding is that the students will come in and they have got all their phones plugged in across our um, um, plugs. That's easy to trip over, but it's also just more and more time that's eaten up. Can I plug in my phone now? My phone's about to die. That lets you know how much they're texting by second block that their phone with a head charge when they walked in is now needs to be recharged. Um, I feel like students can use their phones in, their, in the halls during lunch before or after school and while waiting on buses. Um, I have personally seen students walk in and out of buses and around cars with their earbuds in and not paying attention. That's a huge liability to me for students. And I've also seen students while we're having a fire drill in the bathroom come out and go, oh, we have a fire drill? Where do I, you know, they're, they're disoriented. I need to go somewhere. But they didn't hear because they were locked away. They're in a bathroom with their earbuds in and loud music going. Um, any student using a cell phone for texting, calling, or other purposes not related to an educational purpose, 
such as taking pictures during class or playing games, may have their phones placed in an envelope until the end of the instructional period. Students may not take pictures of other students or teachers without the direct consent of that teacher or student. Um, then I, I looked up the Tennessee Code for, for Conduct, and it says each code shall contain the type of behavior expected for each student, and there's a lot of other information there, and it says including conduct in classes and on school buses and on subjects that are the local governing body chooses to include. And I just would ask that you guys really look at the cell phone policy. Yes, they were a wonderful educational tool, but for us to monitor that with 30 students, usually in our classroom, it's just gotten to be a monster for us to, to deal with almost every single classroom that we go, that, we, that we're in. We can't ask them to put them away, they're right back out. By the time if I'm working with someone on this side, ask them somebody to put away on this side, by the time I work myself back over there, it's, it's out. And so it's just really gotten to be a lot of problem for us teachers. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and I do appreciate, I think we all received a copy of this uh, today, and I was able to read over it, and I do appreciate your work on it, and we'll, it'll be something we will uh, uh, look into at the work session for sure. Now, there's only one more item on here that doesn't require a vote, and that's staff reporting. But, uh, you want to take a minute, or? Oh. Huh? Uh, I'm going to move back to uh, adopting the agenda then. Are there any additions to the agenda that anybody wants to make? <coughs> Can I do that? Yes, ma'am. There was one agenda. Uh, it's added as the very last, last item. Uh, it, it was on there originally and then somehow got uh, kicked off. It's the uh, dismissal of the tenured teacher. But the it, it is on there now. Okay. R right before announcements. Okay, is there a motion to um, adopt this agenda? So moved. Kristen moved, seconded by Mr. Moore. Uh, all right, then we're ready to vote. And that, and that does pass, okay. I'm gonna turn the meeting over now to Chairman Parker. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Kinzer. Sorry for my lateness. Um, I believe we were at the Drake County Education Association. No. So now we're just, what no. do? We're ready for All consent of items. Oh, yep. consent items? Um, is there anything that anybody would like to have pulled from the consent items? Uh, I tried to make it to where everything that we had discussed at the work session, that there didn't seem like there was any discussion about those have all been added under the consent items. But if anyone would like to pull anything, now would be the time. Motion to approve. Second by Ms. Powers. That motion did pass. I'm also a yay. Um, so moving on to new business. 
instruction. Just all FYI. Okay. okay. Um, did anybody have any questions about anything that was discussed at the work session related to the instruction portion? If not, we'll move on to other business. Um, community relations, I'll turn it over to Ms. Powers or Mr. Beaver who had a very successful legislative session. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, on the 10th of uh, this month, uh, I was asked by our state representative, Sheila Butt, to come to Nashville and uh, uh, attend a meeting with the comptroller. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. Don't you tell me something? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. No, uh, Mr. Beaver and I worked together to put to, um, on an event at McDowell School, and we um, we b expected about 25 people, and we got 25 people, so we were pleased. We had a good turnout from the county commission um, and uh, members of the school board, as well as our um, legislators. So it was an opportunity for us to talk about things going on in Murray County, what we need to grow, and what we would like our workforce to look like down the road. So thanks for the opportunity to give an update. Thank y'all for your hard work on that and organizing all those people being there. Um, moving on, we'll go to zoning and facilities. Um, I think the first thing is the train lighting and controls program. Um, there was some discussion of that during the work session. I think Randy's here if anybody wants to ask any questions. As I understand it, it is all self-funding. Sure. Uh, yes, <laughs> this was discussed at the work session, and the um, program is a uh, LED upgrade in, in for the inter all interior lighting and in the buildings in the schools that are listed. There are four facilities that were not included that list because of different questions about future disposition of those facilities. And I know the board has said they want to discuss those further. So we just presented the list. We do have the opportunity through EESI, the Energy Efficient Schools Initiative with the state of Tennessee, to secure up to a $3 million borrowing package. So this list just got us under that, that we put forward to you. It's a 12-year program. It's 1% interest rate. And so what, it, just like the other program we did with TRAIN previously, the energy, this would be a, a program where that they provide a guaranteed savings. The amount that shows of savings over the 12 year period would be enough to pay back the loan, pay for all costs of the program, and then return to the school district about a, a little over $180,000 in savings. I mean, it is a guaranteed payback based on TRAIN's program. What this does, you would be approving the contract to move forward. The contract is written away. It's been reviewed by Mr. Wolliver that it is only binding if we secure the funding. But by you approving the contract, it would give train then the opportunity to go to EESI to apply for the funding. Will it be possible to add back in some of those schools if, as, as decisions are made about long-term features for those schools? We could. We would have to determine at that point how much, it, you know, where the funding would come from, but that could be taken from capital funds or wherever we chose to do that. We just wouldn't be able to do it under the EESI part of that, unless we applied for a future loan, which we possibly could do because they make these available every year. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Breeden? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Beaver. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Breeden, this is the same type program that TRAIN provided us with the upgrade of the heat and air, correct? Yes, sir. It's exactly the same. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do we have a motion with regards to this? Ms. Burns? I'll make that motion. Motion to approve the contract uh, with motion TRAIN? Motion to approve, yes. All right. Second. Second by Mr. Beaver. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we're ready to vote.
All right, it looks like that did pass. Moving on, the next is the update of the prioritized list from the bond premium. I'll let Mr. Braden speak to that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, at the work session, this was on the agenda, but as you remember, we kind of ran out of time and we did not have an opportunity to spend much time discussing this. Uh, at last month's meeting, you had approved, we, we had thought, well, actually we had been contacted by the County Commission uh, Budget Committee with the idea that there was a potential bond premium uh, for the bond that was just issued to build the two new schools. At the time, they had requested that we bring forth a list of how that we would recommend if there was a premium could be spent. And we put together a prioritized list, which you approved, and we were ready to present to them. Um, and we've included a copy of that prioritized list in your packet uh, that talks about um, things from uh, at the time, they thought the bond premium would be between 5 and $9 million, so the prioritized list started with additional parking at Spring Hill High School, a potential addition to pay for a cafeteria kitchen uh, uh, addition, some outstanding HVAC issues, and then $3.9 million from the remaining first year uh, EMG list that remains unfunded. If you remember, there's about $9 million that remains unfunded, but we prioritized it down to three to come up with a list that was just less than $9 million. At the meeting, which happened on October the 3rd, I think, but you can find it if you want to go on, on the website and review their meetings. I think it's called Special Called October Meeting of the Budget Committee. Um, the county attorney said that the way that he understood the bond was written, if they took a bond premium, the bond premium couldn't be spent until all the money that the bond was for was spent. And so that meant that none of that work could be done for two to three years until the two new schools were completed. As they got into discussion, they felt like that was not what we were trying to get to. They asked instead, what if we took that bond premium as just a reduction in the cost of the bond? Bond Council said that could be done as well, which is what they decided to do. But upon that said, if we did that, what kind of borrowing power does that leave us as a county? And he said, well, without raising taxes, you could probably borrow another 18 to $20 million as a county and issue another bond. So there became talk about, well, if we could do that, why don't we go ahead and attack this need at Spring Hill High School by not just building the cafeteria edition, but build the full addition that was recommended by Dr. Register over the next five years, which would include upgrading the infrastructure with cafeteria, can, um, cafeteria kitchen, new auditorium, and uh, an aw additional wing of classrooms to expand the capacity to be about equal to what Central High School is. So both of those would be about 1,800 student capacity high school. And there was a lot of talk. Now, there was no votes. Nothing was taken, but there seemed to be several commissioners who spoke up and said we would be in favor of that, of going ahead and getting that done right away before we get into budget season, before we get into next year, if the school board would bring back a recommendation to do that. So what we are asking you, uh, if you'll remember, last year we asked our architect, uh, ESA, and Hewlett Spencer to come out and do a walkthrough in the school with us. They put together... They put together a plan, uh, which just a rough sketch. There, there's no programming been done, nothing that really would uh, kind of, uh, you know, no specifics. They actually took the, the auditorium from Central High School and laid it in where we build a new. So this is just basically the plan for the Central High School auditorium that we just have added there laid in. They showed where a potential new classroom wing could go. They showed what a cafeteria kitchen expansion would look like. We also at that time talked about possibly some something in the library. We haven't programmed that to even know if that's needed. Um, they, th they did not do a projected cost for all of that, just the first phase of that, which would not include the classroom addition. So what we are asking you tonight is if you would give your approval for us to go back to them we don't have any money, so it's not like we're going back and spending any money, but asking them to do what we did with both the new elementary school and the new middle school is do enough projection that we could come back with a potential budget for funding purposes to know how much money to ask for that we could then 
uh, bring that back to you at next month's meeting. If you approve it, go to the county commission and say, if you're willing, here's what, if you would issue a bond, we could do at Spring Hill High School with an addition to bring the capacity up equal to Central High School. I, I feel like, not sure because we haven't done the work, that there's possible. it's possible we could do that and still ask for that $3.9 million of EMG funds and stay within that $20 million threshold if that really is how much we have in borrowing power with the county. At least I'd like to pursue that, to be able to ask them to help us put together a plan. Here's what adding on to Central uh, Spring Hill High School would look like to grow its capacity to somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,800 students, also fund these additional first year needs at several other schools and put that together as a package. I do not feel like that we can go back and ESA, ask ESA to do some work again unless the board is in favor of that. So what I would like to ask is if you, if you feel like this is a direction we ought to pursue, that we would get your affirmation of that through a, a, a vote, that you would vote for us to move forward. Because again, we asked them to do that once and brought it to you and you chose not to pursue that course at this time. So uh, I just don't feel like we could do that. Do we have a motion to approve um, moving forward with uh, asking ESA to do a, a funding budget? Motion by Mr. Moore, second by Mr. Beaver. Have some discussion. Mr. Moore. Just to clarify, so you're just going to take this and there's no cost involved with this at this point? No, I can't, I'm I'm can't ask you because we don't have any money. <laughs> But I thought you said that ESA wouldn't want to do anything else unless they were going to be getting paid. So are I, we not obligating ourselves for we, something? We are, we are not obligating anything at this point. And I, I have not even had a conversation. They may not do it. But I feel like if you gave them a vote of affirmation that you – and what I've, you know, I would like to ask you to do is don't vote for this unless you're serious about moving forward to Spring Hill High School. Because I think this is telling them if you will invest the time in this, then we're going to be ready to go to the commission and ask for this money. I, I'm just, that may be too straightforward, and I apologize if it's not, if it is, but I, I, that's where I think we're at. Ms. Berenci. With, um, with this addition to Spring Hill and Central, um, can you give us a round figure as to how many years before we would have to build another high school in Spring Hill? I have not totally looked at those numbers, mm -hmm. but bringing both of those school capacities to 1,800 and based on the projection that Dr. Register gave us, I think we're looking at somewhere in the five to seven year range. Okay. Uh, Thank and you. again, that can change based right. on growth. I understand. We're not going to hold you yeah, to it. Because, but. And the reason I say that is because he had recommended that classroom addition at Spring Hill High School in the fifth year in his report. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if, if I could probably kind of answer that. I know we just came out of the redistricting meeting, which was a lot of good information, and I have a feeling that um, when this comes back, you may want to stand. You're obviously involved in that as well. Bring some of that information back to the work session when we get to that point. I think to answer some of your questions, there's a lot of information that they're putting together right now for that that would help you with that, uh, and I think it would also be helpful. For me, I, I, if the staff at this point feels like this is the direction we need to look at, um, clearly building a new high school on the, the, the campus, what we're talking about doing, that would be much more expensive than this. If you guys feel like this is going to get us our needs, and if you're shaking your head and the, the superintendent does as well, I'm, I'm willing as a board member to, to go along with that, but I'm going to have to rely on you to tell us that this is the direction rather than focusing on a completely new high school if that's what we need to do. And I may need to yield to Dr. Marzak, but let me just say first that I believe that the capacity is needed and the ability to achieve funding for the addition is probably easier to get than the funding for a whole new high school. It does not eliminate the fact that if we continue the growth pattern we're on, growth path we're on in Murray County, we will need to build a new high school within the next several years. All right. <clears throat> so we have a motion. I don't see any other lights, so it looks like we are ready to vote.
All right, that motion failed uh, with a vote of uh, four to two. So moving on, go to the instructional low bids. Okay. And, and I don't know the protocol on this. Would it be possible to have this, that inf just have this discussion brought up to the next work session? I th even though it failed, I think it's important enough that we probably ought to have a little further discussion on it. I agree. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, tonight I come to you asking for the renewal of um, ESGI for our pre-K through first grade teachers. Um, this is um, about $17,000 renewal contract for our teachers in those grade levels. It is an online assessment program that they, um, I think you can see from their comments that they think a lot of this program has really helped them in assessing and providing information with parents, to parents, excuse me. And just to clarify, in the memo, it said pre-K first and second, so this is not for second grade teachers. I'm sorry, that was a typo on my part. It would be pre-K, K, and one. Okay. I apologize for that. And so with the comments, I know I've, I've talked with some teachers, and I know kindergarten really loves it, but then I've talked to some first grade teachers that said, mm, I could take it or leave it, I don't have to have it. Is this such that we have it bundled where you have to use it, or... Um, the, how, do, how does that work? As far as the use of the program, I mean, we encourage teachers to use any of the programs that the school board invests in, um, but I think that pretty much so comes down to a principal decision over the expectation for the use of the program. I've received very positive comments from both kindergarten, pre-K, and first grade teachers in regard to it. Um, so I think most of the principals like it as well. We have a couple of principals here if you wanted them to speak to that, but as far as coming from our office and saying you must use this we do not oh, I'm not looking that. for that right. I'm just saying um, I, I saw a lot of the comments that were specific to kindergarten teachers and so if it's just a kindergarten thing then do we get a break if we just do kindergarten I guess is what I'm saying oh, yes, and we took I'm out sorry. first it's grade. a it's a by teacher license um, cost and I would have to pull it up to look at exactly what that cost is but if we needed to reduce the number of licenses we could certainly do that okay um, we calculated it based on the number of teachers we have in pre-k k and one because the, we have information that each of those uh, grade levels are using the program so since it's a per teacher license if you talk to a pre-k teacher and they say no I don't really want to use it then you could subtract that from the license or <laughs> not at this point I probably could before we enacted actually made the purchase I would just have to survey to find out who all actually wanted the program and who did not intend to use the program okay. um, I think it's just a matter of rebidding or getting a new quote on on what we need to purchase okay is the contract that is it are they currently able to use it or do they not have until access November 1st until November 1st and they keep telling them that they are cutting it off November 1st so I'm getting a lot of emails saying I need my renewal code I need my renewal code gotcha Do we have a motion to approve? I'll move that we approve this contract. Second by Ms. Kinzer. Any further discussion? Seeing none. I, uh, let me just make one comment. If before this comes up again, let's if this passes, if there are teachers not using it and we could reduce the cost of it, I, I certainly think we need to look at that. Seeing no additional lights, I believe we're ready to vote. Thank you. <coughs> All right, it looks like that motion did pass. Um, Moving on, I don't believe we have any other operations over 10,000, so we'll move on to finance. Um, I think the next item is the, the keys. Included under that is some information about K2 materials. That information wasn't available for our work session, 
but since we are discussing the keys tonight, I thought that might be helpful for us to have. Um, I would open the floor up to discussion of it. Do we have an updated fund balance? I haven't seen it in a, a while, so. Yeah, so um, discussion with Eric Parliament, it's about $5.8 million is where we're sitting. About. Okay. It, $5.8 million, yes. 5.8 million total or 5.8 million to spend? To spend. Okay. After the 3%. After yes. the 3%. Okay. <coughs> Anybody like to m make a motion with regards to any of the items in the keys or would y'all like to take them? I know we have a new CFO. I don't know how much time she's had to dive into this or um, give opinions on this, but I think um, I would just say that coming from where we've been, we've had some uncertainty as to numbers and finance in general, and I think that may be part of maybe some of the hesitation of board members to just jump out there and give a number. Um, so do you have any thoughts on where we uh, – your thoughts on the keys in general. <laughs> Actually, this week I've been diving into a lot of the basics, um, payroll and some of the issues. Um, and one of the things that we're working on right now is a detailed analysis of the fund balance. So I'm not prepared tonight to give you my opinion um, because I'm going to lay it all out by month and then look at what's coming in, what's going out. Um, historically, if we don't have that yet, we'll, we'll use actuals and then predict for the rest of the year. And then we'll look at the 3% and what's uh, left over below that and then give recommendations at that point. I'd, feel a lot more comfortable after I've had a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. That seems fair. Would everyone like to just punt this to the work session? I was going to make that suggestion. I, I would feel more comfortable, and I know that some of the principals are just thinking, when are you all going to address this, and, and who knows. But at the same time, I would feel more comfortable if we had you had an opportunity to look mm -hmm. at it and give us some specific numbers. and. Uh, and, and that we can look at it again in, in the work session. Sure, and I believe your work session's on the 13th, and we'll have it yeah. way before that for you, so I think that would be timely. That sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Breeden, anything off of uh, food services with Mr. Uh, Parla uh, with Mr. Parkhurst. Parkhurst, thank you. With school nutrition financial report? Just the financial year, that is the end of the numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer those. Okay. Year, but I don't remember the exact number without pulling it up. But we did, they did once again, we're self-supporting and exceeded that. He will be coming back to you, I think it's next month. Uh, he has more money in fund balance than he's allowed to keep, so he will be bringing back for you a spending plan of how he plans to spend that. Because there's a limit to how much money he can keep in his fund balance by the state. Sounds good. Is that? That's a, that's a good problem to have. Yes. Thank but we you. did. We finished in the black. <laughs> awesome. Tell him and his staff we said thank you. Um, moving on, we'll go to the budget amendments. I don't believe we had any this time. So is there anything else in the remaining finance part that anybody would like to ask any questions about? or uh, Are we looking at all of it, revenue, expenditure, all that? Yes. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if... I can pull up what I want to ask about and maybe you can ask the question but answer the question but I'm not sure where to find it I in the in the uh, expenses to date under teachers see and I've lost the whole meeting now so um, I 
I'm sorry, I, I, I got there so quickly. And I'm just going by memory, but I, I would like to, the, the teacher category for the month was two million seven hundred something thousand dollars. I'm not looking at it, so I'm just going by memory. And that's of two out of 12 months. So if you multiply that 10 times, that would make us way over budget for the year in the teacher category. Do you understand? I've yes, I've talked to Mary and Dersky. We're about 200 students over where we were in May. Okay. So in January, we'll be receiving a check for an additional $1.32 million. Okay. And so she's given us authority to go ahead and start to start to budget that money. So we're going to have meetings um, early this early next month, because tomorrow, day after tomorrow is November, about budgeting that money. And if you'll remember going back to um, the budget cycle. I understand that. Yeah. So, so we actually have more BEP money to make up that revenue. I just wanted clarification. In item. other words, we've already got the teachers in here. Yes. And benefits and all that. So that yes. would be also, I'm sure those line items would have to be adjusted at some point. They will. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was looking at the GP historical current summary, and I noticed that it said under fiscal services, um, it said that we were 55% through that budget. And I know that's before think probably before you were on board and then um, do we do we know how much I assume that is mostly for VACO do we have an account for how much we've incurred with them since they began I guess probably back in December yeah, so, so yes and and that account is was dependent on when we got a CFO and when we brought that in. And now that she's in, um, she's working with Mr. Parlant. We're going to code all of these things and now work to remedy them for the remainder of the year. So yes, that, that will be remedied within the month or so. Yeah. Oh, as so she, the as 55 she works. percent being over? Is yeah, as she, as she works to, yeah, to VACO to move out and then uh, uh, basically budget amendments moving forward to take care of that budget line. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I know one of the things it mentioned there was that we had invoices, I think, for VACO, Aliveview, and local government. Why do we still have one for local government? Here with this one. But I believe it's for access to prior year data from their database. So if we're asked to look up something that was while you had local government or the new name, um, then you have access to that database. We did the same thing in Oak Ridge. Because you couldn't convert it over at the time of conversion. Okay. It's historical. Ms. Um, Marinci? How many, um, how many years would we need to continue that? Um, Payroll issues are sort of a life term. <laughs> um, you're responsible for data and providing data. Um, but we could uh, maybe get some advice from our legal team on that and, and maybe get some direction on the maximum years. A lot of records are seven years, some are five, but payrollers are usually forever, um, just as uh, their student data that's kind of forever. But we could. Uh, so you're saying we'd be responsible for paying ten thousand dollars a year forever? I would like to get that verified. But usually, payroll items, we are. Um, we we do have to go back into the records. I don't know what your paper records are like. Um, haven't had a chance to look into that yet. So, if the requests for payroll data are far and few between, and you have good paper records from back way back when, that might suffice. So we could look into it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not your fault. <laughs> Any other questions on the finance portion, Ms. Kinzer? Okay. All right. Moving on, um, we have some FYI items and. Um, we will now move on to the attorney client meeting. So we will go ahead and convene that and return.
All right, we are reconvening after our uh, attorney client meeting. Um, our next item is a, a recommendation from the superintendent um, for dismissal of a tenured teacher at, to certify the charges for dismissal against a, a tenured teacher. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Bates, second by Mr. Moore. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, we are ready to vote. All right, that motion does pass. Uh, moving on, announcements, Dr. Marsden. All righty, thank you, ma'am. So uh, just announcements for the month of November. On November the 13th at 6 o'clock, we're right back here for a board work session. For the week of the 20th through the 24th, that will be Thanksgiving break. Central office will be closed the 22nd through the 24th. Hope everybody travels safely for uh, Thanksgiving. And then we'll be, we will be back here on October or November the 27th for a board meeting at 6 o'clock. And that's it for the month of November. Ms. Kim, sir. Motion to adjourn. All right, we have a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank y'all for a short meeting. Ms. Kinzer did a great job. <laughs> <laughs>